very much. We're going to be uh, looking at Genesis, Genesis 42 to this morning. And so if you want to, it'll be up on the screen. But before James is going to come and read it to us in a few moments, but let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you in this moment. And God, we pray. Would you minister and speak to our hearts? God, I pray, Lord, that as we hear your word today, Lord, may it penetrate us, will it transform us, Lord? Would you open up your, our eyes to what you want to say? Holy Spirit, become minister and speak, and speak to us. Would you, Holy Spirit, transform us to be more like your son, Jesus? And God, I pray, Lord, that Literally everything and anything that's over me, Lord, Lord, may it just be forgotten out and be blown away. But God, this is a, a moment where we want to discover you. So Lord, everything that's of you, Lord, may it resound in our hearts. Would you, would you transform our hearts? And would it penetrate our hearts? In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. James is going to come and... Yeah, you can come for me if you want. Read Genesis 42. Yeah. So from Genesis 42, from verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Verse 6. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord. They answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it's, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh leaves, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you're not, then as surely as Pharaoh leaves, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will leave for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. 
Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. Verse 27. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. The, their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that has God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, The man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, We are honest men, we are not spies. We were twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is Lord over the land sent to us, said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. And trust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he's the only one left. If harm, if harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. That's just the word of the Lord. Thank you, James. All of us, as we know, as we get older, bit by bit by bit, we all, in some way, encounter loss. Trauma, had, trauma comes our way. The, the more we get older, the, the more we gain, but sometimes the more we lose at the same time. And here we encounter Joseph, uh, sorry, Jacob and We almost have like a, a history of his life. We, we meet him in his mother's womb. We see him grow up and deceive his brother Esau. We see him flee from his brother. We see him encountering a different land and he meets the love of his life. But just as he was tricked, he gets tricked. And he ends up marrying the love of his life's sister. And so he has to spend more years, another seven years, for the love of his right wife, Rachel. We see him having multiple, so lots and lots of sons through not just Leah and but Rachel as well, but not just them, but through their, their servants. Twelve sons, but Rachel is the love of his life. He loses Rachel just before they're reaching Bethlehem. She gives birth to Benjamin and she, and she passes away. We don't know when Leah... Leah, Leah, Leah passes away, but it's mentioned that she's buried in one, one, of, the caves, one of the caves. But there's an element of, although Rachel was the love of his life, it was Leah who gave birth to the tribe of Levi and to Judah. The love of his life gives birth to Benjamin and also to Joseph, and we see as he, go, as he grows that as Joseph goes off and he receives 
his son's coat dipped in blood. He's absolutely devastated. I'm sure for all, all of us, losing a child, I'm sure all of us would give up a right leg, a right arm, or anything for that. It's devastating. And here we, we know that he's wrestled with God, wrestled with an angel. And we, we see him in this time. And although God has blessed him and he's been working, he's also been in a season of famine. Not only is there famine in the land at the time, but in himself, there is a season of famine. I wonder, for all of us, are there areas in our life which actually, although there's other areas that are, that are thriving, are there areas in our life that are perhaps going through that famine period? Where it's health, whether it's looking for that job, where it's fa- whether it's family, the family isn't quite what it wants to be. Some of you might be thinking of wanting to sue Disney about, you know, all these families that seem to be, hi, mummy, hi, daddy, and you think, you know, it, it paints this rosy picture that but when it comes your way, sometimes it's anything but. And the dream of perhaps what was you're wanting to be perhaps quite wasn't how it's turned out. I wonder what famine... What areas do we have? Sometimes there's moments of famine which you can look at it in two ways. The first way you can look at it as sometimes through no fault of our, no fault of our own, Situations and, situations and circumstances come our way, don't they? We haven't done anything wrong. Perhaps, perhaps the company's made a bad decision and you get laid off and sometimes you're in a desert, situa- uh, a desert and, a fa- and a famine situation like, like Jacob. You haven't done anything wrong. It's, it's just come your way. It's just part of life. But it's also famine situations and lies that if we were to look ourselves in the eye and be real with ourselves, sometimes we've caused them. If we were truly honest, sometimes perhaps it's the, the way we behave, the way we spoke to someone, the, the way we've treated people, the, I wonder, the way we've reacted or that's caused a famine. There's lots of different ways you can look at it in perspective, can't, can't you? But there's one of the areas that Jacob says to his sons. And he says, in verse 1 to 2, he says, Why do you look at one another? Behold, I have heard there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy for Buy for us grain that for us there that we may live and not die. For Jacob is in the famine, but he knows if he stays where he is, if he doesn't do anything, if they don't move, if something doesn't happen, nothing's going to change and they'll end up dying. I know there's periods in, in my life where actually. God's used the famine in my life to move me on. And sometimes I haven't wanted to move on. I didn't get the memo. I didn't understand. Because sometimes God brings you to a place and you think, oh, this is fantastic. I was there, but now everything's going well. And you start to set up camp, don't you? 
you start to get comfortable. And sometimes we treat a resting place as a permanent destination. And the trouble is when we do that, we don't actually fully walk into everything that God wants us to walk into. We don't, although we've obeyed God, we don't fully, fully obey him because there's still that area of our lives that is saying, you know, I just need you to go a little bit further. You've camped in a resting place. And so sometimes they're, you're thinking, God, everything's going well. And so why, is this bit of a, why does it feel like a bit of a fan? Because sometimes actually there's a bit of movement that, that's wanting to happen. It's like, it's like I, I need you to go. If you stay here, you're going to die. We know for Jacob, Jacob, he's old. He probably doesn't want to, tra- he doesn't want to travel. And so he's he, he set up camp. Everything's going, going, well, everything's going well, but he sends his sons out. He doesn't want to physically move because he's old. He, there's, uh, you, know, you, you, you name it, fill in, fill in the blanks. He's old, doesn't want to do it. The, t- the time and the travel, there's no, there's no reason the hurt and, and the pain. It's just like, do you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to stay put. But some of those areas in our lives where actually God's saying, I just need you to move. I just need you to move. Sometimes there's areas in our life where there's famine because although there's times where it is right to give praise and worship to God, there's times where we're to lay ourselves on the floor and say, God, you are holy, and I'm just going to sit and wait for you to say something. But there's also times of there's also times and moments where people have famine and people say all the time, you know, if God wants to give me a job, he's going to give me a job and they still sit on the sofa. And we've all been guilty of it sometimes. Once in a while, haven't we? We'll just sit on the sofa. You know, it's just been a time. I'm going to sit on the sofa and we just we, we click it. And you know, if God wants me to have it, it's just going to, it's just going to happen. Forgetting the fact that God might have given you gifting, he might have given you the ability to do something. If you want to be an artist, you still have to pick up your pencils or your pens and learn how to draw. You still have to find home your skills. You can't just draw a circle, two dots and a smiling face and go, I can sell that for a million pounds. Some people do, I do not know how. But (laughs) you're thinking, my daughter can draw better than that. How is that worth that much? It's amazing, isn't it? But you see, some musicians, some musicians, they spend hours and hours and hours just playing scales. And it's boring, isn't it? I don't do it, but, you see, but I don't play, don't music, I've got arthritis in my fingers, won't know, I've tried learning bass. It was going okay, and then just, my, just can't do it. Fingers, gar- the case of gardening and cracking my knuckles when I was younger because I wouldn't listen to my parents. And, <laughs> and so... So even, so even now, don't even do that. My, my left feet, my left just clicks. And, and so even now, arthritis in my hands because I didn't listen. Cause I got off, so you got almost like a famine and, thing and things like that. Because there's things in our life that God's given you the ability, but we still have to fine-tune it. We still have to put it into practice. We still have to learn how to sing. We still need to, okay, I can, I can manage people, but can I do it really well? Is my character in check? Do I need to learn some new things? And so although God's given you the gifts and abilities, we haven't, what people call it now, is upscaling yourself. We haven't learned and taken our skills to the level that God wants us to be in order to feel and to walk into the area where God's doing it. We've just thought, God's going to bless me, and we don't do it. And so when the, when we, the opportunities do come, we fail because we haven't got the the skill set, we haven't taken it further. We've just assumed it's going to be, I don't need to go for an interview. God's going to give me a job. I don't need to go for that because God's just going to give me a job. Forgetting the fact that sometimes God will give you a job, but sometimes you still have to apply for the job. you still got to go for the interview process. You still have to move forward. You can't stay where you are and expect companies and people to headhunt you there's that end of that moment of 
God's saying, I've called you to something, but there's still that you need to get better. Saying, for example, the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, she still had to physically crawl her way up to Jesus and touch the hem. The miracle happened, but she still has to physically move. The amount of people in the Bible that God's healed because they went to Jesus. We know in a blink of an eye, we know that God, if we pray for someone who's not in this room, we know that God can heal them. We know that. We, we know that God can do anything, at anything he wants at any, at any time. He's all-powerful, he's, he's all-knowing. The earth and everything in it, the universe, all of it is his. And he just has to say one word, not even just a blink of an eye, do any, he can do anything he wants. But there's also some moments of where people time and time again say, God, I need you to heal me, I need you to heal me, and they haven't been healed, and they're persistent, they've been persistent, they've kept coming forward for prayer, kept coming forward for prayer, and we don't know the answers why, but it might be the 50th or 60th time they come for prayer and God's healed them. But we know he could have done it right from the very start. There's some answers which we don't know, but what he does want us is to go to him. And to listen to him and say, okay, God, what are you saying in this, what are you saying in this moment? Sometimes we're in a famine because actually he's telling us to move forward because actually in that moving forward, we need to say to the family, do you know what? I was a complete idiot. I wasn't the, the son or the sister or the brother or the, or the dad or the mum who was supposed to be. I caused that argument. There hasn't been restoration because you haven't moved forward. And we find that, that we live in areas of drought and famine. There's also, you see for Jacob... And you get a glimpse into the family life that for Jacob, there is a famine in the family. He's lost Joseph, where he thinks he has. And he's devastated. And we all naturally would. And the Bible says that you know, everyone came towards him and tried to console him, and he couldn't be consoled. And And we notice that he sends his sons, but he doesn't send Benjamin. Why doesn't he send Benjamin? Because it's the last remaining person, son of the love of his life. Rachel. He's lost Joseph. He's not losing Benjamin. I wonder when we go through trauma, which is real, which is genuine in our lives, what do we cling on to? And it's not out of love, it's out of, it is out of fear. He's holding on to Benjamin. The rest of the sons, you go, but I don't trust you, Benjamin. He's years old. But yet, the family and the culture of the family, there's an element of distrust. I can't trust you. Have you, have, have you ever had one of the family members come around and your parents say, just keep an eye? If you haven't, perhaps that's you. I don't know. Right with me. But sometimes, here you had friends come over and it's all good. You know, it's all good. You, you, love, you love them, it's fine, but you still have to watch them. You've had better friends than I have. Do you know what I mean? There's sometimes where you can trust people and people come and it's like, okay, they're good, but just keep, just keep an eye. Because there's an end of, I don't know what they're going to do, how, what they're going to say, how they're going to react. We can't trust them in certain situations. And so there's elements of, we still live in those elements of distrust. 
and, fam and families do, and people do, and friends do, and brothers and sisters do, husbands and wives do, friends do. Society does that, where you can say to people, do you know what, I really, you know, I just forgive you. Five, ten years go past. And even though they say that they've forgiven, they still live in the past, and they still bring up all the dirt that they said that they've forgiven you for. It still gets thrown into your face. Or you throw it into their faces, because... Although you say you've forgiven them, you haven't really. That trust issue is still there. When someone says something, it gets on your nerves. It grates, it grates you. Yeah, it triggers something because you've gone through that trauma and it, and it triggers something. And so you react in a certain way that's perhaps out of character that people don't quite understand because it's come out of the hurt and the pain and the loss that was there. And for Jacob, he sends his boys, but he's holding on to Benjamin. I wonder, what are you holding on to out of sheer fear? One of the things that's common in abusive, abusive relationships is that the person who is being abused is often told... You won't find anyone else. No one else will love you as much as I love you. And sometimes, and so sometimes people put up with abuse because they have a fear of, actually, if I lose what I have now, I will not get anything else. And so you'll put up with friends. You'll put up with people. You'll put up with a bad, a bad workplace. You'll put up with bad managers. You'll put up with things because you think, I can't get anything else. And so it's out of fear that you, even though you don't, you don't like it, you hold on to it. Because there's a fear of, I don't know if I'm going to get any better. I can't afford to lose this. And I wonder what Jacob's eyes and voice and behavior was when he was speaking to his sons. Did he grab Benjamin by the hand and drag him close? Was he hugging him? Was he keeping him back with one hand and saying, no, you go, you go. You go. Did he have his servants surround Benjamin as a bodyguard saying, you're not going? Did he lock him in, shut him in his tent and say, you're not getting out and putting people around and so he couldn't escape? How did it happen? How did it... I wonder what he did. I wonder... What do we hold on to that we just need to say, God, I'm holding on to something out of fear because actually I know you've got stuff better for me. But I'm hurt. And I don't want to face it. Because face it, when you've been hurt, when you've been through all that sort of stuff, it hurts when you then have to open it up, doesn't it? When you've been trying to move past it and try to get and try to get past it and to move forward, it hurts when you've experienced trauma or you've experienced loss. But the only way to get healing is to open it up and bring it into the, bring it into God's light for Him to bring healing. If you don't bring it into the light and let God examine it with you and say, Do you know what? I was mistreated. Flip it on the other side. Open it up to God. I w did suck as a friend. I was, abus I was abusive. I did say that. I did steal in my workplace. I wasn't, I wasn't honest. I cheated on my, cheated on my friend. And, and we have to, it's not just playing the victims. We have to also be real with ourselves that we've all done things wrong. And we all have to own up and say, I did that. Because we look at this story and very little do we talk about the sons. They are the ones who threw Joseph into the pit. They are the ones who decided to concoct this tale and sell, his, sell their brother into slavery, but into slavery Yes, they did wrong, but they are the ones who've had to live with the guilt all their lives. 
And sometimes when we've been through trauma, we want justice, don't we? We went, that's not right. That should not have happened to me. And you're right, that shouldn't have happened to you. What happened was not right. What that other person perhaps did, what, that, what your friend said, or what those group of people did, what they spoke lies about you said, that wasn't right. But if we take vengeance and we hold the bitterness and unforgiveness, we end up living a life of famine. You always go back to speaking back to what happened to you. For the sons, they go off to Egypt and they're brought before Joe. Jo, we, we know it's Joseph, but they don't know it's Joseph because Joseph's given a new name. And I'm rubbish at pronouncing that name. But we'll give it a go. And so, is it... Uh, I've got it... The, some women. No, no it's. You ready for this? Zephaniah Panif. We'll go for it. If it's not, it is now. <laughs> and there, which means there's two meanings that's. They are talking about Joseph's name. And one of the names means the, the God speaks, the God speaks and he lives. And the other interpretation, there's debate between the, the meaning of his name is the revealer of hidden things. But Joseph's but Joseph's actual name means to increase. which is interesting. They're brought before what, they, we, what we know as Joseph, but it's a different name. And so although they're brought before, they don't know who's standing before them. For Joseph, he's been thrown in the pit, sold as a slave, thrown into jail, Accused of things that he didn't do. I wonder what's been spoken about us? What's been spoken about you? Well, one of the things that we learn from, from Joseph, he's, has, he's had such a bad, what we you can say, turn of events that come his way that he didn't ask for. But all through it, at the beginning, when he was boasting about, you know, God's given him this dream, he could have had, you know, the character could have been a little bit better. There's, there's that delicate of a bit of wisdom of how you say these sort of things. But you see this trait that he has, no matter what he's in, he's honouring God. And God gives him a gift. And he's got gifts and abilities given by God, but he's also been given a dream. He's had a promise. He's had a promise. And one of the things that we need to, to, to realize is that when God gives us a promise, when we know that God has said this, there's that character issue within it. There's that heart issue with it, within it that, yes, God might have promised it, but we haven't, we haven't yet received it. We haven't yet walked into it. We haven't moved into that yet because we're still on that process. And along the way, there are going to be bumps. It's not going to be plain sailing. There are going to be people around who's going to be jealous of you. There's going to be people who make fun of you. He had his brothers make fun of him. They were jealous of him. But sometimes people have had a promise and a calling from God, and something's happened to them. And even though the calling and the promise is still there, they wasted their lives just complaining about the pit. And you see it all the time. Even though God's calling them and moving them, saying, I want you to move into something else, they're just saying, do you know what? I was thrown in spirit. This happened to me. That happened to me. And there's that heart and character issue that Joseph is saying, yes, that happened to me, but I'm moving forward. My character is still going to be 
good. I'm still going to be, have favor with the guards. I'm still going to honor God. I'm still going to move forward and still do stuff for what I'm going to do. I'm still going to use my giftings or interpreting to glorify God. I wonder, has God had a calling on our lives and there's been areas of our lives where we just wasted time complaining about where we've ended up? I wouldn't, be here, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be blessed with a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter, a beautiful church and beautiful people within it if I hadn't gone through a bumpy season. The opportunity wouldn't be there. And I've talked about it, and I don't need to talk about it because I've moved on, but and in the time, it's traumatic. You're thinking, why on earth is this happening? It's not right, because other people do, have done stuff. But then I can look back and say, yes. That was wrong, but God's turned it around. And I can hold my peace and say, yes, that, was, that wasn't right, but the fact that I'm here where I am, I can, be, I can stand, if I, I can use my free will for anything I like. So I can stand here, and even though, though I'm blessed with blessed of being part of a fantastic congregation, having a fantastic wife, having fantastic friends here, my heart can still be bitter and angry and say, do you know what happened to me? Do you know what happened to me? Do you know what happened to me? And I'm not thankful for what God has given. I wonder, is some of the famine caused because our character? God, you find that you've got the giftings, you've got the skill, but every time you go to a certain place, the door slams shut. Because you're always negative. You're always arrogant. Pride kicks in. Anger creeps up. Are there areas in our character that we need to say, God, actually, I still need to deal with that? Because actually... I'm not walking fully into what you've called me to do because actually my character isn't right. How many times do we see time and time again, we see people, they rise up to a position and all of a sudden because they haven't dealt with an area of their character, something happens and it hits the news or they make a bad mistake or they make a bad decision. God doesn't want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want you to be on a, on a headline. And we see this how, time and time again, you know, about pastors, you know, someone's made a mistake or someone in the, has made a mistake or his football has, has made a mistake. But we never hear about the pastors who, and the people who, have, who characters find and they, and week in, week out, are diligently serving God and they get no credit whatsoever. There's more people that do good in this world and are helping people that don't hit the headlines. It's just that we one or two people just hit the headlines and it makes news and we, sm- we smear everyone with a big brush. There's loads of people out there doing fantastic jobs. Not everyone is a bad egg. And one person makes a mistake and is like, that's why I can't trust them. No, that's perhaps, you can't perhaps trust that person. Perhaps one person's Stabbed you in the back, you can't trust people. Because one person stabbed you in the back, or two people, and you filter and you go through this, and there's the attitude of actually our character isn't right. I wonder if God raised you up to a position of power and influence over people, would you use your power to get revenge? Would you spread negativity? You see, this later down the, you see this later down the line when the spies go out to the promised land, they scatter. Two come back. Do you know what? We can do this. But the others, they get put into position of scouting out and, all that, and their character is negativity. Are you a person that just goes around spreading negativity? 
I know God said that, but have you seen, I've done this, I've done that, and you're just putting stuff down. Joseph is in a position of absolute power. He could have his brothers killed in an instant. But he doesn't. He doesn't. But Joseph, Joseph is in a famine as well. Although he's in the palace and he's eating the fine foods and he's got the people around him and he's leading them through this trial, he's in a famine because he's been, he's been longing to see his family. And he uses his power to bring restoration. He uses his power to bring healing back to his family. His brothers, when they come before him, the brothers will be brothers, they start bickering between each other. Because they're fearful of what Joseph is going to, what this person will, it, it will do, to, do to them. And what, what do they say? I told you we shouldn't, we shouldn't have done it. We should have let him go. And they've been living their whole lives bickering between each other about what they did to Joseph when he was younger. It's amazing. They go to Egypt to buy grain and buy foods and they end up bickering about Joseph. How does that even work? Unless it's been playing on their mind for their whole... They haven't, they haven't been able to forget it. Jacob has been mourning. It's been going through the culture of the family. You can see it, the whole culture of the family is still mourning, going through this famine of the loss of Joseph. Do we still keep going back to those instances of what we've done in the past? I know for myself, that's one of the attacks that the enemy does to me daily. I remember something that I said to someone in the past. I remember something that I did in the past or I was like, did I really do that? And you know when you get that really deep sigh from within of disappointment? I was like, but there's a moment of you can either go, and not deal with it or go and so I'm real so I have to every single day when I realize okay I said that I did that I behaved in that way my attitude wasn't great and I had that say God I'm bringing that into light would you forgive me for that would that be blotted would that be blotted out and sometimes God's got a bit of a sense of humor because sometimes I say to God God may I forget that And it feels like a lot of my past is being forgotten. And areas are like, I don't remember that bit. I don't remember. But there's areas where God is bringing healing to the past, but I'm having to, as it's being exposed, as it's coming towards, say, you you said that, your position that you are, but you did that. I'm having to bring that into light and say, God, I don't want to live in this famine. I don't want to live out of this going back to the past and beating myself up. The only way to move forward is bringing it into light and saying, God, would you forgive me? I hold my hands up. That was me. That was me. I did that. I said that. And owning it, that's what part of the cross is for, that when we own it and say, God, would you forgive me? He is gracious and kind and he's forgiving and he's merciful. And I know forgiveness on a daily basis, because on, on a daily basis, I was just like, I remember saying that. I remember doing that. And sometimes the enemy tries to bring that up again. Then the phone down, I was like, no, dealt with it. You tried, that, you tried that yesterday. That's forgiven. And it's part of the healing process of acknowledging it, moving, accepting it, moving. I wonder, are there areas in our life that we keep looking back at and we keep fearing what is going to happen. Oh, there's people that, although they're with you, they're not really with you because they're fearful of what you're going to do. I, they're, they're not too sure. I, 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 oh, you go bring up that incident from earlier. Or perhaps you're fearful of, you know when you're around people but you're not really around people? Or 
although you're engaged, you're still trying to work out what's, what's happening in this relationship. Some relationships are just transactional. Sometimes that's all you've known from perhaps it's family or friends is that the love that you know is like, if I do this, you'll, get, you'll do this for me. If I do this for you, you'll do this for me. And sometimes the relationships and the friendships that people have is a transaction. And so when people do something good for you and you haven't done anything good for them, it freaks you out. Just like the, brother, just like the brothers. Joseph blesses them, puts the, the coin, the silver, the money back in the bags and sends them on their way. And they open up and not only have they got the grain, they've got the silver back there and they freak out. I wonder, are you so used to transactional relationships that when you're, you're afraid to delve into something and actually say, do you know what? I want something different. Do you only give because you are expecting something back? Or do you give out of a, a sense of, do you know what? I'm not expecting anything back. I know you can't give any back, and I don't care you can't give anything back. I just want to bless you. I just want to love you. Whether it's important, I'm going to, t- I'm going to buy you a coffee. I'm going to drive you down to the shops and wait for you and, and, and bring you back. Whatever, whatever, or whatever, or whatever it is, I'm going, I'm going to support you. I'm going to support that. I'm going, I'm going to ring it. You fill, in, you fill in the blanks. I wonder, are some of our lives, we have to stop the transactions and go, God, I need to open up. I need to deal with the hurt and the pain and the famine. Do we treat God as a transactional I'll turn up to church and I'll sing a few songs if you do this for me. And we treat God like a cosmic vending machine. We press the buttons and we expect the Coke can or whatever to fall at the bottom. If it doesn't, we give it a kick and you know, hit it on the side and expect it to, to come out. That was the wrong one! And you, try, and you, and you do it again. And so sometimes we, we treat God as a cosmic vending machine. It's transactional. And we don't open up because we're afraid if we open up what might be exposed. And we don't want to be exposed because... We don't want to let people know. We don't really want to let God know who we really are, even though he knows it. I mean, it's a strange psyche. We try and hide stuff, and he just knows everything anyway. But we still try and keep things hidden. And he said, if you just bring things into the light, stop living in the famine. Some of you have experienced the love of God. Some of you haven't, perhaps haven't to its fullest because your heart is still closed. I can't trust. I've been hurt in the past and I can't trust. What happens if he hurts me? What, and all, all, and all, of, all of this stuff. If you don't deal with the famines in your life, you'll never walk into the promised land, what God has called you into. You'll never fully appreciate and experience everything that God's called you to do. He'll be present. He walks with us through everything and anything. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. He is merciful. He is kind in his grace. And even though we keep pushing him back, he is still present. We, we think we're pushing him back, but he doesn't go back. He stays where he is. We just think we've done it. As if we can push God back. Whether you like it or not, he follows you every single day. He's with you every single day. He's present every single day. And whether you're going through the bumpy times, he's with you. Whether you're going through, living in trauma, he's there w- walking through the trauma with you. That's one of the promises that he gives to us. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Till the end of the age. And even, when, even to the end of the age, he's still with us. He's with you for eternity. He's with you for eternity. He's not going to hurt you. He's not, going, he's not wanting to harm you. And sometimes we put things on God when it's actually it's our fault. God let me down. Actually, he didn't let you down. He just didn't move. God, I wanted this. Well, there's that act, there's that element of yes, but... Were you obeying? Do you go, go through? There's, there's, there's an element of, yes, sometimes God blesses, but sometimes there's an element of, we receive God's blessing when we're walking, when, when we're journeying, and we somehow we, we stumble into, 
How did I get here? And you, and you realize, actually, I'm walking in the blessings of God, and I don't even realize it. Some people are raised to a position of power and influence because they can be trusted. And everyone hates it when someone starts to, why are they, why are they getting, and like, why, why, is, why, are they why are they being promoted? And sometimes it grates on people's nerves. Sometimes we just like, oh, you know, that should have been, or oh, actually, God raised Joseph up, up because he knew out of all the sons he could trust him. God knew out of all the sons he could trust Joseph that when it came into this moment in time, Joseph wouldn't abuse his power. Can you be trusted with God? Can you be trusted not to abuse the giftings that you've got? Can you be trusted not to lord it over people? I've said it before, David and Hezekiah were raised up. And what did God say about them? He said, I have blessed them for the sake of my people. When you get raised up into a position, it's for the sake of the people, not just for you. You might be in the benefits of that position, but when you get raised up into a position, it's about looking after the people underneath you and around you. Are you a good manager? If you, if you think being in the church is being a pastor, you're wrong. Being, it's not, it's, you're wrong because actually, if you're an owner of a business, if you're a team manager, you are a pastor over those people underneath you. You're responsible for... Are, are they getting treated right? Are you treating them? Are you treating them right? Are you looking after them? Are you protecting them? Are you helping them with their times, or haven't you got time for them? Just haven't got time. You're too busy. Pressure, pressure, pressure. How are you in the workplace? God's kingdom isn't just for a Sunday morning in a church. God's kingdom is for everyone, and it's everywhere. No matter where you're working, no matter what you're doing, God's kingdom wants to be active and wants to be present and wants to work through you in every single area. So whether it's just leaning over the next door neighbor's fence and saying, how are you doing? Can I give you a hand? Or showing love to people, showing love to people. wherever you go, that is your mission field. That's where God's called you to be. Joseph isn't in, a ch- in a, Joseph isn't in the tabernacle. He's in a palace. Are you in a school? Are you in a sh- supermarket? Are you like me? You working with the, worked with the local council. Where has God called you to be to bless the people underneath you and around you? And not only that, to serve diligently the people above you, even though you hate them. Even though they might be corrupt, can they trust you with integrity? Can you be honest amongst all the dishonestness? Can people know that if they place something in your hands, it's secure and it's safe? And there's integrity and honesty there. Do we have a heart in the famine? Shall we pray? God, we, as the band wants to let's come back up. God, I pray, God, that throughout everyone's life, no matter where they're at, Lord, the famines that come our way, God, first and foremost, we humbly come before you and say, God, if there's anything that's of us, that if we have caused offense, if we've caught hurt, if we've caused trauma to people, 
If we've acted badly, God, we just want to bring that before you and say, God, that was us. Will you bring forgiveness? Would you show your mercy and your kindness? Would you help heal my heart? God, I pray, Lord, would you just, Holy Spirit, just continue to move. God, I pray, Lord, where, where our character hasn't been right, where we've been selfish, arrogant, prideful, envy, jealousy, all of that stuff, Lord, Lord, we just pray, Lord, would you transform our hearts, would you transform our hearts to be more like you? Would you help us to be more like your son, Jesus? Would we be full of mercy, full of love, and full of compassion? Would we be slow to anger and rich in love just like you are? And God, we pray, Holy Spirit, would you just come and where people have been walked and been journeying through trauma? God, I pray, Lord, in a way that is suitable for them, Holy Spirit, would you just come and bring peace and healing? Would you bring peace and healing? Whether teachers in the past have said something, whether friends, family, work colleagues, whatever, have said something, done something, hurtful, abuseful, God, I pray, Lord, you bring healing to our souls. God, would you help us to take that step moving forward? Would you help us to move from a position of trying to survive to to thriving in your kingdom? Jesus, I pray over every single person here, would you breathe life? Would you breathe your life into them? And God, anything that the enemy has used to try and kill and destroy God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we rebuke that and say, may that be gone. And God, just as Jacob and Joseph saw the reverse of the curse, may we know the restoration of of what has been taken away. May you give in abundance. May you restore to us what has been taken. May we be truly grateful. In Jesus' name.